Okay, now it's time for Unit 9. We're going to be looking at emergence, which is the rise of a system or behaviors that cannot be predicted or explained from antecedent conditions. Writing in 2008, philosopher of science Mark Badal notes that 30 years ago, emergence was largely ignored in philosophy and science. Its ethos ran counter to the reductionist views of the time, and it seemed to invoke mystical and unexplainable levels of reality. Well, things have changed. Emergence is now one of the liveliest areas of research in both science and philosophy. So now we've had over 40 years of taking emergent phenomenon seriously as objects worthy of scientific study. But as Badeau was writing this, there was still a problem, a very serious problem with this research. To some extent today, emergent phenomena are still considered qualitative, still considered phenomena that can't be measured or studied scientifically, really scientifically. Some researchers fully embrace this. They think that's the point. Others work to finally reduce the phenomenon to quantitative descriptions. James Crutchfield, in the paper you read for today, offers a method for measuring the changes in the system when an emergent form appears. He's a reductionist of sorts, but not in the way that most people imagine reductionism. His method falls somewhere in between quantitative and qualitative. He was my mentor in graduate school, and it was from him that I learned to think of the distinction between qualitative and quantitative is sort of a false distinction. Some background first. For years, the fact that some phenomenon seemed to defy reductive explanation was dismissed by science. Empirical science requires some measurements that can be tested and that can be used to predict behavior. The gold standard of science is to construct a model, describe how that model can be tested by doing steps A, B, and C. And if you do A, B, and C, and the predicted outcome does not hold, that model is false. If the predictions are accurate, then that model is true for conditions A, B, and C. The standard is tough, as it should be. But this makes being a biologist pretty difficult. It makes doing science with any complex system pretty difficult. The anti-reductionists claim that complex systems like living organisms are inherently unpredictable. You may be able to make general predictions that are accurate within some range, but never precise predictions about specific events or behaviors. Reductionists counter with the claim that as one gets more and more information, one can make more and more accurate predictions. You just need more data. And that's pretty much true, but there's always just sort of this nagging feeling that something is left out or not quite well understood, as, as you've learned from our discussions, starting with Don Favreau's History of the Science of Semiotics. With the discovery of deterministic chaos, the reductionists claim had to be given up. The discovery was made possible by computing power that could calculate more and more data and run models of nonlinear interactions. Complex systems are nonlinear. There are many different causal factors interacting and causing positive and or negative feedback loops. When a system's behavior is nonlinear, this means that your ability to predict complex behavior does not increase in proportion to the amount of data that you gather. It just doesn't. It's different when you're doing a statistical analysis. The more data you gather, the more accurate your predictions will be. If I measure the number of people in a coffee shop on one day, this may not give me a measurement that I can use to predict the number that there will be the next day, but if I take a sample every day for a year, I will be able to make a fairly accurate prediction of how many people on average will be there, be at the coffee shop the next year. This just doesn't work for complex systems. So if you're filling out a form to get research funding for some project studying a complex system and you're asked what kind of quantitative methods you will use, please remember this moment in class and pause. You're going to have to put something down, but be as aware and as upfront of the uncertainties of this approach as you can. In the 1960s, Edward Lorenz was trying to model a weather system using a computer. He constructed a model using nonlinear equations, got a prediction, but 
but then he ran the equations again after rounding off a really insignificant decimal place, something like the ninth place. He ran the equation again and he got a wildly different outcome. Now that wouldn't happen in a statistical model where insignificant changes to the measurements remain insignificant. So these days when they make predictions about the weather, they take the outcomes of a number of slightly different nonlinear models and sort of average them together. It's, it's kind of a workaround fix, but I suppose it works well enough and it's the best we have. The stable climate is an emergent nonlinear system. Our climate models are necessarily approximate. If they fail to predict actual outcomes, it won't be because scientists fudge the data out of political motives or intellectual fashions or whatever. I will be surprised if we are not surprised by the outcomes in 10 or 30 years. The outcomes could be much worse or not as bad or pretty much close to what is predicted. If you've wondered why there's so much emotion surrounding this science, you can blame it on deterministic chaos. People would like a statistic to hang their hats on. My position is that the current levels of pollution damage animal and plant health, and current levels have already caused unacceptable ecological damage. Retrodiction, tracing the causes of events in complex systems, is also very difficult, but not quite as hard as prediction. I think it's a big mistake to claim that climate predictions are fairly certain. As nonlinear systems ourselves, we humans have a good intuitive sense of how hard it is to be certain of anything. People may feel railroaded. I believe perhaps too idealistically that scientists should never condescend to the public, should never spare them the complicated details lest they be confused and unable to act appropriately. Instead, present the facts. Most people aren't that stupid. I really believe this, but I digress, but not that much. It's irrational to put a great deal of trust in predictions about complex systems. There's ample room for doubt. But I want to offer you some relief. It's stressful to be so uncertain. I don't want to encourage any of you to become relativists and give up on seeking truth. You'll never succeed completely, but don't give up. So let me tell you about Crutchfield's idea for some biographical background. And I do this because giving you some completely arbitrary and irrelevant detail about Crutchfield's life will give your brain an arbitrary sign to glue your memory to. And we'll talk more about that in a later unit. Crutchfield was an avid surfer who attended a kind of radical college in California where they had a very relaxed approach to studying. Students were self-directed. They studied whatever they were interested in. Crutchfield studied dripping faucets and video feedback. Chaos. His research led to discoveries that cast him as a main character in James Gleick's best-selling book, Chaos. He liked to point out that while the fashion at the time was to spend billions of dollars on super colliders, he was making important scientific discoveries with bad plumbing. In his paper we read, Is Anything Ever New?, Crutchfield makes a radical move. Before him, science had always put the observer outside of the system. And he puts the observer inside the system in order to get an objective scientific description of emergence. What does this mean? So to explain this, he has to set up the problem and the method. Crutchfield says that models of complex behaviors need to include four different kinds of mechanisms. One, mechanistic determinism. That's cause and effect of Newton and Einstein, where the observer is outside the system under study. Two, statistical mechanics. Because mechanistically determined systems can be very large, too large to be described in complete detail, and because of deterministic chaos, this leads to the absolute necessity of leaving out some factors in your model and just using probabilistic summaries of those factors instead. Three, computational mechanics. It is not enough to say that a system is ordered and random per mechanisms one and two. What is important is how these two elements interact 
to produce the complex system. Computational mechanics describes the interplay of randomness and order that gives the structure. Think of self-organizing pattern formation. Four, evolutionary mechanics. These describe the processes wherein the, genu the genuine novelty emerges. Evolutionary mechanics describe, quote, the constraints guiding and the forces driving the emergence of complexity, end quote. So after the scene is set with the determinism, with the local physics, the statistics, that's where the model of determinism is fudged a bit. Self-organization is kind of the holistic physics that define the pattern. And for the last part is the reasons for the change of the pattern when a new rule is invented. That for the bird in the flock keeps it moving gracefully in a simultaneous flow. So let's put all this together to talk about the position of the observer because that's Crutchfield's main point. Let's get that observer in the system. So the scientist who wants to understand emergence in a flock first like, films the flock, measures their movements, constructs a model of their behavior, how close do they come to each other, how fast, which way do they point, and you also throw in a little bit of randomness. Then Crutchfield folds the observer into the system to measure the interplay between the rules and the randomness. To what extent does the randomness matter, such that the patterns are maintained or not? What is going on in this interplay, this feedback between rules and randomness, that at some point initiate a sudden change in the rules? And for the flock, this means a new shape emerges. The bird, as an observer, is both taking measurements, responding, and causing the changes in the next set of measurements. Crutchfield says, the observer in this view is a sub-process of the entire system. In particular, it is one that has the requisite information processing capability with which to take advantage of emergent patterns. And I suppose the scientist outside of the system doesn't have the capability to take advantage of the emergent patterns and use them to be part of the flock. But the bird does. The bird is in the flock. It matters to the bird. And this is probably ringing a bell with you from last unit, what I said about Alan Turing's theory of reaction diffusion processes, which are both self-constraining and self-creating at the same time. Crutchfield then offers a framework that specifies how to be quantitative in detecting and measuring the structure. The structure of the interplay between the order and the randomness. So he's a little bit different from other complexity scientists who might quantify the degree of order compared to the degree of randomness. But with Crutchfield's model, let's say we have a bird that has an algorithm it's following, if A then B, if B then C or D. And within this algorithm, it has some wild cards where it can do anything. Other complexity sciences would just count the number of random moves compared to the algorithmic ones. But Crutchfield seeks to discover how the algorithm is organized in relation to the apparent randomness. Is it somewhat predictable when the unpredictable move occurs within the algorithm? Is the ratio of predictability to unpredictability changing over time? This structure, this relationship, he says, quote, indicates the degree to which information is being processed in the system. Computational mechanics, he says, goes beyond statistics toward structure to describe, quote, an algorithm for innovation with which an agent can jump inductively to a new model. Roughly speaking, the observing responding bird detects increasing regularities in neighbors' behaviors. Then there is a jump to a new model, new rules for behavior. This puts, quote, the subjective aspects of discovery into the system under study. In this view, analyzing emergence is more objective, in that detecting emergence requires modeling the dynamics of the discovery process. So you're not just figuring out the rule that the birds are using, but how they got there, how they developed that rule. He goes on, quote, complexity and structure are no longer referred outside, 
no longer relative and arbitrary. They take on internal meaning and functionality. And the overall mandate of Crutchfield's method is to provide both a qualitative and a quantitative analysis of natural information processing. Okay, so yeah, how does this analysis from a physicist and how he approaches complex systems, understanding emergent behavior, how does that help you as a researcher if you're studying some sort of complex system? Well, I don't know, <laughs> but let's try to speculate together. So he is interested in the changes that the observer or participant in a complex system undergoes. So what one of the things that you might want to do is instead of interviewing people and trying to understand what they think now, how they understand the situation now, you might be more interested in interviewing people when they're undergoing change, when they're in the midst of a decision process. What sort of things are they certain about? What sort of things are they uncertain about? And how is the relationship between those things changing? That might be one way to apply what you've learned here to your research. Here's a typical diagram showing how you might approach qualitative research. You ask a lot of questions, you interview a lot of people, you sample some data, you write down a lot of facts, you organize this, and then you do it again, you do it a different way. This diagram shows how things are kind of circular and you can go back and redesign things and just sort of be open-ended about how you go about it and, and reinterpret it and to redefine it. I think this type of diagram is helpful for you to organize your plan and also communicate with others what your plan was after the fact. But I do think that writing out a, a diagram like this is scientism. It's trying to make your qualitative approach look like some sort of scientific procedure that had rules to it that you followed, when in fact, qualitative research really involves intuition, wisdom, lots of experience, being open-minded, being very observant, and there isn't really a plan for that other than talking to people who are experts about this subject that you're interested in. Experts are observers who have been folded into the system and you may want to try to discover the process whereby they develop their current models and try to understand how their thinking has changed over time. Because you don't really understand the rules that are guiding any complex system or complex behaviors or decisions, unless you understand how they came to be, what sort of, what kind of combination of totally accidental events and situations combined with facts and reality led to people developing a new sense of new rules or new understanding of their situation. That might help. I don't know. But, but that was a lot, and, but this is important work, I think, and I hope you enjoy the conversation we have about this after.